I, I teach, so my first question is the mother for joy. <laughs> okay? All right. Do you, this is it. Do you think of yourself, I mean, your own your self-concept as, and you've been asked this before, I'm sure, a poet who happens to be black and female, a woman who happens to be black and a poet, or a black who happens to be female and a poet? <laughs> One, two, three. Yes, I have heard <laughs> that sure question. Uh -huh. question I asked in uh, several kinds of ways. Uh, the first thing I think about myself is that I am black. And anybody who is black is uh, obliged to understand that above everything else. Mm -hmm. I don't know what my sister here would say about that. We'll get into that later. But that is uh, my answer. First of all, I am black. I had quite a little discussion with... Uh, the editor of a really fierce little magazine in Chicago some years ago. This magazine uh, was called The Literary. Um, and he came out, I was teaching then at Northeastern uh, State University in Chicago. He came out to interview me. And we've been friends for a number of years. I've helped him with his... Uh, little publication which was always in trouble and now he's white and um, he asked me a question similar to that and um, then I asked him a question I said when you uh, see me what impresses you first I said I if I see you I see my good friend Gwendolyn Brooks I said no you don't I said suppose uh, you're at one corner and I'm at the other corner and you see me approaching the first thing you think of is not your good friend Gwendolyn Brooks but something black is coming toward me and uh, then as I get closer you notice that I am a woman something black and female is coming toward you finally you see your good friend <laughs> <laughs> by that time you got it all together what your reactions are going to be, your response, and what you're going to say and feel. <laughs> so he thought about that, and he said uh, reluctantly, that was true. That's how other people see you, and, but that's the way you see yourself. This yeah. world is absolutely uh, race conscious, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd I, 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 I really like to debate this with other people, mm -hmm. see if they agree with me, but I think that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, when you said race conscious, I feel that we are race oriented. Is that a Race that aware? Um, I mean, I think that we are oriented into thinking racially. Well, who's doing the, the orienting? Do you, well, would the, you the say? The white, uh, <laughs> you know, the white man. Is the, that's where the race orientation has come from. Yeah, I can't say that. Mm. I mean, I, I, it's a stronger word to me than conscious. I think it's an orientation. It's something that's been forced upon us. Yeah, it certainly has. I yeah. have a I'm lot of saying it is all organized. <laughs> My second question um, and is, you've been compared to Edgar Lee Masters and to Carl Sandburg, and what I'd like to know is what poet did you read it at Mile when you were young? Because you really had no no role model that would really suit yourself. And and who were your early inspirations? And compared to Emily Dickinson and recently to Walt Whitman, which just surprised me. Oh, no. I didn't pay any attention to Walt Whitman until I was in my 20s. And uh, he is a poet that I like to look at. You know, the way there are some people you admire, you know that they're good, that they're important, mm -hmm. but there are other people you'd rather be with. You can be cozier with mm -hmm. them. So I was cozy with, uh, um, it might surprise you to hear this, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, his early poems, mm -hmm. not the later ones. Profound. When I met him, uh, his when I met his work, um, and that wasn't until I was about 16. Langston Hughes. When I found out about Langston Hughes, I was really delighted because he was writing blues and ballads. 
and uh, I began to write blues and ballads. So he was a real uh, specific influence on myself and what I wrote. Um, <coughs> James Weldon Johnson, I discovered his work. I, I found out about these poets in a little library around the corner from my house. And um, there was a little book in there called Caroling Dusk. Have you seen it? Had a lot of black poets mm -hmm. in it. And I was very impressed because I found out thereby that black poets could be published. Mm -hmm. They were writing and they could be published. I have to insert that James Lovin Johnson was born in Jacksonville, where we are. Yeah, he's our, he's that. our native son. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, but, I began yeah. sending poems to him when I was 15 or 16. And uh, he would write back with little notations in the margins, correcting this and that. Isn't that I still incredible have those. that he did that? I uh -huh. think that's really and he also funny. sent me a couple of letters saying that uh, uh, I was talented, I must keep on writing. Oh, encouraging like that is nice. <laughs> I have um, some general questions. Thank you. Thank you. Aspirations, you can write over, roughly over, past the future. And I'm wondering. Longer. Longer? Since the age of seven. You can subtract seven from sixty-two. <laughs> <laughs> can you do that on this paper? What do you think? <laughs> 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 okay, so as a black girl growing up, I had no idea that the things that have happened to me would happen, no, no. But when I was a little girl of seven, um, my mother said I brought her a page of rhymes, and she was sure that I was going to be, she, and I know she never said it, so Dr. Shaw introduced this such a thing. Uh, you are going to be the female. <laughs> Paul R. Sunbrush. She might have said something like, you're going to be the lady Paul R. Sunbrush. But um, she had a great deal of faith in me. So did my father. I was very fortunate in having parents who believed in encouraging their, their children to have a brother. And uh, I kept on writing. I certainly wanted her favor. That was pleasant to have. But also I found out that it was... Uh, a release to put my feelings and ideas down on paper. So I knew from the age of, certainly consciously from the age of 11, that's what I was going to do with my life, write. Whether I was uh, published or not, I knew that I would always write. How would you describe the style? Somebody asked me that last night. Um, style. And I said that style. I don't think that authors ought to be worried about their style. I think that would be inhibited, um, crippling. I think that style is the you-ness in your work. And that uh, you, tr you try desperately to be yourself on paper. That's very difficult if you are finding out. <laughs> Because writing uh, uh, they-oriented poems in broad terms is um, uh, a hint that um, the you wants to come out but hasn't quite managed it. I know because as I told you, I've done it myself, and still fall into that trap and have to yank myself out of it. Now, of course, once in a while, I will. I know I'm getting off this subject. Um, I will write a poem like uh, a Primer for Blacks, which I wanted to do exactly uh, what it did. It, I need, uh, once in a while, <coughs> we blacks need something to uh, cut into us and uh, uh, shake us out of our, our apathy and our self-hatred. So I didn't mind having a broad address, but not in too many poems, because I, I like personal poems. I like <laughs> to look into my life and find particular incidents, frights, triumphs, 
love, whatever. Very personal. And begin personally. And then, if necessary, um, if it so happens, it might broaden out into something general that still has to avoid a cliche-ishness, and that is difficult when you're speaking in broad, general terms. My next question was going to be, how do you get your ideas? Oh, well, I get notions and ideas. I get a lot of ideas on transportation, on trains. Mm -hmm. Of course, we I, all do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, it is for uh -huh. some reason. And uh, uh, well, I'm no longer flying, but when I flew, I look out in the clouds and get ideas <laughs> and um, I write down as briefly as I can what has impressed me, how I feel about it. Then when I do have the time, I spread all these notes out and forge a first draft and uh, begin the revision and that is something I pay a lot of attention to. I ask myself, is this word really what I want? Does it really say that I, not Wordsworth or Shelley or Keats or William Butler Yeats wanted to say? And uh, I try to weed out all cliches. I'm a cliche hater, and I hate to have one get by me. Uh, so I ask myself, is this, well, of course, if you ask yourself, is this what I am really saying? It's not likely to be a cliche. Because you are not Wordsworth or Emily Dickinson. Do you do you have friends whom you trust enough to <clears throat> to show them your poems before you let them out? I mean, do you trust other people's judgment as far as your work is concerned, or do you just trust your own judgment? Well, now I used to, when I was much younger, belong to writing workshops. Mm -hmm. You know, one especially was a. Uh, uh, started by a reader at Poetry Magazine, a woman did yeah, now, I mean, Inez Cunningham that. Stark. And uh, she came out to the South Side and started a little poetry class, she called it. It was really a club, very warm, close club. And we were all young and impressionable in those days, and we'd go up to her house. She was very wealthy, and she had a, a an apartment on the Gold Coast. So different were those days in appearance <laughs> that she had to come down and stand had to come down the elevator and stand in the lobby waiting for us to come otherwise we never would have been with my husband and myself or, and the other black members of this club well she um, introduced us to books like Robert Hillier's First Principles of Verse we swore by that at that time it's a very dangerous book to read all by itself now, I, I know. And I'd say that about any single text, that you need mm -hmm. to read a lot of books and take what you need from them, but it takes time to get that understanding. Now, we showed our poems to each other and waited with bated breath for the response. I no longer uh, do that, not even with my husband, who writes. That's the way we met, because we both wrote it. And we met at the age of 21. He still writes and has a very good book out called Windy Place. His name is Henry Blakely, B L A K E L Y. <coughs> is that poet? Is he a poet? Yes. Mm -hmm. that, and that's a book of poetry, Windy Place. And uh, I, once in a while, he'll bring me a poem that he has written. He's into other weighty matters. He's writing a great big tome that uh, has to do with a project he wants to begin, an economic uh, uh, economically based project. But once in a while he will write a poem and sometimes he will show it to me. But we used to sit together and write together. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us needs that any longer. Each of us knows what we want to do and where we want to go, and where he wants to go is not precisely where I want to go. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, so the answer quickly is that I uh, 
and no longer have that need to show people work that is in process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd rather wait till it's all finished <clears throat> and then it will be published because I have uh, decided that I can't do any more with it. So you, you, you depend only on your own critical judgment as far as... Yes, that worries you, doesn't it? Yeah. No, well, no, no. I, I hope someday I'll get to that point. But. Well, when you do show your work to your friends or people that you do trust, um, aren't you a little concerned sometimes that uh, experts, though they are, they aren't you? And yeah, maybe and I particularly find that true of of male poet friends that I show my work to. Um, some of the, you know, some of the, I, there's something that, that was said in, in, in something I was reading, I guess I've read a lot <laughs> lately, so I can't remember what like, talking about, about images, and, and you, you said, or somebody said, you know, black people can't write about trees without thinking about lynching, or somebody said that. Well, I did say something okay. like that, not quite like that, not, but yeah. I said that it is possible to write about trees. There was a lot of discussion about on this point in the late 60s and uh, a lot of the poets said uh, it was wrong for black boys to write about trees and flowers and nature, anything mm -hmm. that uh, Wordsworth had done, etc., etc. And I would say then, and I still do say, that it is possible to write about trees. Uh, they, they are relevant. They are relevant to uh, a black concern, if only, if only because so many of us have swung from them. Mm -hmm. And I wish we had time, and you didn't have to depend on me, so I could just roam and range and uh, give you a further example of what I mean by that. And after you are through, I'll tell you. <laughs> we oh, we have, listen, we have time. Don't worry about it. Because then we've got yeah, tax and time, and we can, we can add it the where we want to. I mean, you can. I want then to in that case, then I'll so tell you now. I'll be as brief as I can. <laughs> okay. When my husband and I went to Ghana in 74, oh, we'd have long discussions. We, that whole trip, which included going to uh, uh, England and France also, uh, resulted in so many arguments and we would uh, even in these foreign countries stay up till four o'clock in the morning uh, tearing into each other about this point and that point that we did not see alike and uh, uh, we were out in the road one morning beautiful morning and we saw a little Ghanaian boy <laughs> uh, running down the road looking like the perfect picture of happiness and my husband said, uh, now look at that, look at that. Isn't that a beautiful sight? So now why, if you were writing a poem about that boy, why couldn't you just write a poem about running boy, happy in the sunshine, and let it go at that? Well, it puts me in mind of what I just said to you. <laughs> so I said, in accordance with the argument we had had that night, uh, uh, a black poet has a responsibility to be exhausted. So when a black poet looks looks at a at a at a at a at a boy writing, a little black boy writing, uh, much more must be seen than just the joy. And I said, um, well, I reminded him of a boy that had been in my daughter's high school class. Wonderful boy. He had won so many awards and just a nice boy who, whom everybody thought was going to go somewhere. And um, one day he was running, running boy, running down the alley somewhere. And a policeman said, stop! And, uh, and uh, <laughs> he couldn't stop fast enough. And I don't know if you know about this circumstance. Maybe it's different in Florida, but in Chicago this happens all the time. Some policeman is forever shooting something black like that. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I said, uh, this boy is, oh there's just, there are just so many writing possibilities there. You think about what he's going to meet on his running road. And it's a road that is different with uh, different potential and different ends from the road of another kind of boy. May I jump in here and uh, say something to me that the image of running to is that 
until black people began doing their own writing to write out of their own experience, their organic mm -hmm. writing, white people were writing about mm -hmm. black people. And to me, you're running to catch up with all of those experiences and to describe those experiences from your point of view. Running do you, do you see up. what I mean? There's so much that has not been caught by the black writers. Because they were so busy imitating white writers. Yes, and because they were not writing for so long. It's <coughs> similar to the, to the white female experience of, of art, of not even participating in the process. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Um, I think Douglas was writing, but it was not, there hasn't been as much writing by blacks that we know about. Mm, that you know about, yes. That we know about. There's been a lot of writing about black people by white people. Yeah. But writing of your own experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the people who well, I'm sure that there were many blacks uh, putting down their ideas and feelings and deciding that there was no point in sending them to Harper mm -hmm. or Macmillan, so they were just accumulating drawers. I know every once in a while we'll come up, come upon uh, some batch of really exciting raw material, mm -hmm. you know, that somebody has been amassing people, people that you would not consider might be about such... Uh, an enterprise. And this, but the same thing, the same thing is true of women writers too. I mean, for we, we, the ones that we had for a long time, and there weren't that many, were the ones that were imitating, you know, the male, mm -hmm. the male poem. Yeah, they not didn't writing have any other models. Our, we weren't that writing they knew out of our own experience then, you know. So there's, there's a real similarity there. Mm -hmm. um, oh, did you, did you, did you Go ahead. Something else that I had that was going to follow that is. Um, the Southern black was not yet um, articulated as much as the Northern What black. about uh, Richard Wright? No, I know Richard Wright. And I Margaret mean, Walker, who was elected to stay in the South. No, I know that. But I mean here in the South where the, the worst experience of the blacks took place, we don't have, um, it seems to me that, that, the, that either they have moved to the north. Oh, well, that's something mm -hmm. different. Are they 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 decide to move. Some of them have moved to Paris. Are there contemporary <laughs> ports that we don't know about? Yeah, there are a lot. Yeah, have yeah. you read a good deal of black poetry in, yes. in these uh, collections that yes, keep coming out now? Yes, but who in the South, writing living, I'm talking about living and staying, uh -huh. in the South, for instance, Georgia and Malcolm X had said that, you know, in his autobiography, he said that uh, Negroes born in Georgia had to be strong simply to survive. Um, yeah, I I'm don't, sure that's true. And, um, and all the other southern and all states. the southern states and also the northern states. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know they did. And the well, I mean, I great admiration for blacks because they have had a lot well, to I know. use your word oppress them, and they have survived. Yeah. Uh, I I just wonder how many whites could survive what we have been obliged to survive every day, mm -hmm. every minute of every day. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, and I was talking to Audrey this morning, I was telling her that my, I, I was born in Jacksonville. I lived here all of my life until I went to college. You too? No, I was born in Nashville. Same thing with this kid. But, but um, uh, my first experience of a strong woman, and my only experience of a strong woman for about the first 10 years of my life was a black woman. Fanny Lou Hamer? No. Um, she worked as my mother's maid. My mother had no responsibility because that was part of our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the strength that I saw in a woman, and it was a black woman, and I watched that strength. How did she exhibit her strength? She exhibited her strength 
physically and mentally because her hours of work were very, very long. And also she had a family. Very naughty of you all. Yes, exactly. And I had a tremendous amount of guilt about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she... How, you know, know, how did you know to feel guilty about it? Okay. You know, did you have it then, or did you have it now? No, I had it then. No, I had it then. I knew because I began reading so very, very young. And um, when I started in the grammar school, close to my home, I, I lived in a wealthy neighborhood, but I went to a grammar school and had a marvelous library. And I started reading. Gosh, I, I, I read a book of T. Washington, who was the first book I read. Uh -huh. um, and um, I just... Um, you know, I don't know what it was. I think it was a, sort of an innate thing. Was it discussed in the family? Did your oh. parents discuss this oh, oh, subject no. with oh, you? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Of course not. Well, that must oh, have been oh, quite oh. agonizing to you if you were having these it ideas. It was, and I spent many, many years with her because, I mean, she, she, had a, she lived there with us. And, uh, um, I hope she was... She ultimately died uh, from exhaustion very hard life. And that still goes on in Jacksonville. You see, this is what I'm talking about. Of course. Mm -hmm. well, well, these the these people got, have still got black maids. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And you see, this is what I'm saying. If this experience that you are writing poetry and the poets are writing, but is it coming in? It's, how, it's in Georgia just just as much as it is in, in, in Florida and yeah, Alabama. And, and, um, <coughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, um, but I don't know exactly what it is you are saying to me. I, I, well, first of all, I was just saying the strength that I saw, you know, a, a, a black, that was the first strong woman that I saw. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering why I'm, I'm not saying poetry. I perhaps am just not saying it, but poetry is being written in this part of of, of, of my world. There are a lot of poets in the South, and mm -hmm. I can't rattle off their names mm -hmm. for you, but many, many movements, uh, writing movements began in the South um, uh, during the uh, days of the Harlem Renaissance, and certainly in the late 60s, mm -hmm. uh, before the late 60s, in the mm -hmm. early 60s, they began to spring up, because I keep mm -hmm. hearing about them and meeting people who said, I belong to such and such a writing group. And not only did they write, but they would ha have have little touring projects. They would go around in in uh, number in groups of three or four, sometimes ten. I forget the name. Do you do you know Tom Dent? Yeah. Uh huh. Really well, well, he I'm was a, me a member of one of those very effective groups mm -hmm. for a long time. So I think it's communications mm -hmm. that are lacking. You know what I was struck by when you were describing your childhood in Chicago as a, a black girl in Chicago, your childhood, Christmas and Easter and so forth, sounded just Very like American. my childhood I know. as a white girl in that Did Nashville, you read Tennessee. the paragraph that followed that yes. description? Yes, I did. When I said how and sad I, I it was the that, 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 that the, my the, household, my black household, and no black household that I knew of was blackness oriented. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't know anything about African uh, customs. Of course, there's nothing like Christmas that we celebrate mm -hmm. in Africa that I know mm -hmm. of. Do you? And if it is, it is uh, white born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So much is covered over. But you do, have, you do have good memories at that time because of the family. Of course. Cl close to them. It's and all brainwashing. We uh, were taught uh, to by, by example and precept, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. Now, after the 60s, uh, 67 and 68, when I met the young people that uh, have helped me so much nice. to come to a proper understanding of myself in this society, I stopped buying Christmas trees instantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we celebrate, uh, observe, <laughs> Kwanzaa. In my, or at least I do. My husband doesn't pay any attention to light. <laughs> 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 but um, still and all, there is that leftover. You know, we have really been taken care of in this country. So that this past, I didn't last Christmas, but this Christmas I bought a plan. I was having a company that does celebrate Christmas. I bought a poinsettia. 
No Christmas tree. What a point. <laughs> they yeah. didn't just that little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. I said, oh, well, it's a pretty flower. <laughs> but uh, the, the people that I know that uh, I like to call essential blacks, people who are, uh, who have ideals like Haki Imai Kuburti, uh, formerly Don L. Lee, of course. Was he a black star, one of the black stars? No, no, some people have thought that because mm -hmm. he joined my group, but... Uh, but he went to Wilson Community College. Uh, Wilson yes, he did. Uh -huh. How did you know that? Right. <laughs> and, um, oh, he and his group would have no part of a poinsettia <laughs> or anything else. Very down on that kind of thing. Has any of that um, smoothed out or... Or is it, is it still a good question? No, no. Uh, now he is consistent, and his Institute of Positive Education is consistent. They are still doing what they did before. They're dressing the way they did before, uh, except that he doesn't wear a dashiki all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he doesn't dress like little Lord Fauntleroy either. But uh, their ideals and plans for. Uh, Black progress and black um, uh, communion remain the same, but a lot of people have left that scene, as you must know, and uh, have become uh, uh, once again fifty-ish. I mean, uh, the way blacks were in the fifties and the forties. Yes, a lot of people think of me as being part of the Harlem Renaissance. However old as I am, I am not. <laughs> I belong to the, the the little excitement that followed the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem Renaissance featured Lyson Hughes, Johnny Collin, Claude McKay, Jesse Fawcett, um, and I Georgia you. Douglas Johnson. Was she part of that? Might have been. Arna Bontam, of course. <laughs> and incidentally, there's a wonderful book out now of Arna Bontam letters, uh, Arna Bontam Langston Hughes letters. You've got to get I that. So oh, oh, it is so exciting and so rich. How these people could have found the time to write those. And they're, you could tell that they're just letters. I don't believe they had in mind that they, well, maybe they did. I don't know. But they're very warm, open letters. And I mentioned 14 times in there. I counted <laughs> to my vanity. <laughs> I wanted to know what they really thought about me. <laughs> I said, not okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Richard Wright and Margaret Walker formed another movement, I guess you might call it. That's not a good word. And I came along, I'm uh, a few years younger than Margaret Walker. She wrote For My People. A couple of years after that, I came out with a street in Brownsville. And Native Son and Black Boy. So I think of us as being a little group, too. Sterling Brown belonged to the Harold Renegade. <laughs> Black Hawk Well, my first uh, feeling, as you say that, is that uh, these are, are uh, cliches that uh, uh, bother me because, quotes, the real thing was so different from anything stiff and nailed down like that, black cultural nationalism. Um, the people that I met in the late 60s were really convinced, at least at that time, that uh, blacks must get together love each other, curry each other, nourish each other, and know that their faith was in their own hands, that their essential, ultimate faith was in their own hands. That is, if they didn't do anything about um, uh, things that oppressed them, uh, nothing would be done. If they didn't do something, nothing would be done. And there was such a warm family feeling at that time, this is what I recall, and loved and missed. And blacks would be out in the street, see each other, wouldn't dream of, uh, well, great 
swarms of them wouldn't dream of doing other than saying, Hi, sister, hi, brother. You know, and now you see them walking stonily past each other. And if you say something, <laughs> it's almost worth your life. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> That is something, part of that is something that I said, um, I said if in my autobiography, uh, if, oh, I said that uh, blacks would have to find some way of getting along with whites as long as they lived in this country, and most of them that I know say they're going to stay here. But there can be no more of that uh, head patting. You know, you're a nice little nigga. You know, be nice and uh, we'll let you stay here, maybe. <laughs> but I said that uh, if there were any dealings between whites and whites, they would have to be straight across. It's not exactly what I said, it's straight across and eye meeting eye and um, uh, really. Real equality, which is a word that bothers me. No more. It's just again the parent and the child. Right. No more of that. No more of that. I I really wanted to get in on all the identity. I think I think Southerners, particularly, at least in my part of the South, which is. I guess uh, uh, sort of a metaphor for, for almost the South as it is all over. We have this strange thing about uh, white people thinking that their race will be contaminated by intermarriage <laughs> if we have busing, and they have no concept of the fact that blacks have no interest in that whatsoever. They don't well, certainly they aren't looking into no, history. They have no idea. <laughs> they when that make, mixture was elected by their own ancestors. Exactly, and also they have no concept of black, nation, of black, black nationalism, black, or what <laughs> for want of a better word, of black people having a pride in their own color. Well, now, we really have to say something about that, don't we? <laughs> uh, once again, because of brainwashing and other things that, are, that are, are too deep to go into and take too much time to go into now, and also I'm not, I'm not qualified uh, to speak scientifically or sociologically, <laughs> but uh, 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 they are seeing, more is the pity, uh, uh, arrangements between uh, black men and white women, that's one of our, our, our uh, frustrations and uh, something we'd like to do something about. And uh, it was part of the heart of my poem, Ballad of Pearl May Lee, which was um, offered from the viewpoint of somebody who's much neglected in this mix, mixture of literature, uh, the black sweetheart who uh, uh, has a few feelings on this on this point. My my uh, character uh, has suffered all her life from having her dark complexion uh, resented, rejected, and it just got worse and worse until finally, uh, <laughs> with her black sweetheart not only favoring the white complexion members of their own race, but went outside the race and. Uh, you know, I'm, excuse me, but that's I'm something I didn't good. understand until I until I started reading some of the things you had written about the difference in the in the color. You know, that the lighter complexion. Whites are always telling you that. I, I didn't know uh -huh. that. I had no idea about that. Well, I haven't well, you know, you know, you know, you know, that. Well, that is I really have, something I that you need to to know, uh, to know mm -hmm. you know, because it has an immense uh, influence on our life. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was people of white uh -huh. complexion. Now, of course, there was more of this before the 60s when people began saying black is beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it good. has not changed uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 organically. Although they uh, now feel able to hop 
hop the line and go get the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, the, the lighter complexioned uh, women are, uh, are still uh, often favored. Um, and they get better jobs. Is that why? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, on television, they, they're still, they're, they're having, it's re, it must be real frustrating <laughs> for the, uh, the, uh, the well, authorities, well, you look at the administration <laughs> there, because they want, uh, they, they naturally, naturally <laughs> favor the lighter complexion uh, black women, but they often have to have a real black spot in there so that everybody will know that they got one. Uh, you know, I have to say something right now. Your mother, your mother, is she? A, was she as remarkably beautiful as her pictures? She is a beautiful Everybody woman. is beginning to to say that she was a beautiful woman, and even when she was in the hospital, she died in seventy eight, mm -hmm. almost ninety. Well, no, she died at home. She had I'd had her home for what is it, a month or so, and she was. She died at home, thank goodness. But uh, she died when she was uh, 90 and two weeks. So she was in the hospital when she was 89. And the nurses kept saying, what a beautiful woman she is. And it's interesting that that comes through photographs. She had the loveliest neck. I used to just love to look at the back of her neck. <laughs> the shape of her face, everything, uh -huh. just elegant. Um, we're talking about women and, and so forth. You know, I, I want to read something, a couple of things to you, and I just want you to respond. Um, in 1971, and I know you've been asking this a lot of times, so I want to, I want to go on to something else. You, um, you said that women's work is not for black women for the time being because black men need their women. I wish you'd find that place. I'm sure I didn't okay. say women's lib is not for black women. Well, maybe you didn't. That may be I'm paraphr I may be paraphrasing. What I, I have said, said, <laughs> what I have said and say, which is important, is that uh, black women have to be careful about women's lib. Um, yeah, I have said that uh, um, a certain a certain aspect of Women's live, as I have seen it, must be forsworn. And I have said, I don't know if it's in there or not, this particular problem, I think, that um, I've been on panels with some of the, the women's uh, live personnel. Nobody like Gloria Steinem or anybody like that. But uh, I was so impressed with the hatred that these women, these particular women, and I know it's not everybody because I have met others who weren't that uh, inclusive, but they hated their men, mm -hmm. just hated them. They had a fierce hatred for them. And I have said and say that black women have got to avoid coming to that path because that would be another divisionary tactic and uh, we're going to get nowhere with the men going off from the women and the women going off from the men and uh, both sections hated. we got problems right now. But we certainly don't need to intensify them. Um, um, I don't know how you feel about her very much, but she is... Like her. In like fact, her? she was my uh, my uh, office mate when we both taught at uh, City College I, in New York. And, her and we new, had some nice long book, talks. Her new book, Secrets, Lies, and Silence. Have you seen no, it? It's a collection of essays. The last, the last chapter in the book is called This Loyal to Civilization, and in it, she discusses the problem of racism and the problem of sexism as being very related. And she and I want to read you something and ask you to respond would. to it. <laughs> okay. She said, um, and these are two paragraphs that are taken out of context, but I think they flow. The mutual history of black and white women in this country is a realm so painful, resonant, and forbidden that it has barely been touched. Yet until that history is known, that silence broken, we will all go on struggling in a state of deprivation and ignorance. And then she said, it would have made a great...
<laughs> well, probably because it's out of context. Mm -hmm. Probably because I'm reading it to you out of context. But what she's saying is the 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 basic essential evil was patriarchy. White. And yeah, well, white white male supremacy. You don't need to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and that I you know that you that was that 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 was what we were all struggling um, under. You know, and and so there is a, a relationship. I certainly there. wouldn't uh, fight the fact, her fact, I think that uh, uh, white women were suffering in the times of slavery too. Mm -hmm. But really, that just does not seem to me to be what black people should be uh, uh, richly concerned about. They have enough to take care of on their own. I, uh, I think it's wonderful that there is. Uh, a women's movement and uh, uh, black women are also women and there is much in um, women's way of which just doesn't sound very respectful <laughs> uh, that affects them too certainly mm -hmm. but on the bottom line is the fact that blacks uh, have got their they're continuing serious woes, and they must help themselves. And uh, I don't see how they can. I know that they can't help themselves if they accept another division. Mm -hmm. The problem, I fresh mind, is so much greater. I, I think. I mean, I well, I I'm not sure really Other people are free to decide that for themselves. Yeah. We continue to feel, strangely enough, oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that uh, if we start scattering... Now look, I, uh, uh, I have a great uh, feeling for the Indians mm -hmm. who have been mightily oppressed. And you can call that by the white patriarchy if you want to, perhaps... Uh, I guess the women. Well, I got married, so I'm called a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, um, well, I'll start at the beginning. I had two kids 11 years apart. So for a long time, I just had the one child. And that child, um, when he was asleep as, a, as, a, as an infant, I would write things. And uh, when he finally went to school, that's when I gave most of my uh, attention to Ray. And um, about maintaining a home, if you mentioned that, I never worried about uh, having everything immaculate. I've always been one that likes order. I go crazy in my head if everything is scattered all around. But so far as uh, polishing everything just <laughs> so, I've never, ever done that and have no intention of ever so doing it because there are more important things to be said. Uh, but I was lucky in that my husband yeah. also wrote, so he understood um, my feelings and encouraged me. He was very encouraging, always. Um, well, I guess that's about it. Now, I run all over the country. And uh, I was miffed when I thought about it. Uh, I was at Indiana University about a year ago, and uh, a member of the staff out there, a black woman, youngish, she, she looked like she was about 35 or 40, and uh, uh, she seemed to be full of beans, you know, that really had some gumption and spirit about it. And uh, in the question period that followed my reading, she asked me uh, something like this. Uh, how is it that, that you run all over the country, that you're away from home so much, and you leave your husband there? Uh, I wish I could remember exactly how she put it. But uh, that made me so angry because... Uh, and I tried to get her to understand this. That's a question that would never be asked of a man. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever asks a man who travels. Uh, uh -huh. Aren't you worried about your wife? How can you stay away from him so much, from her so much? So uh, 
I certainly am very women's living <laughs> in that regard. I believe a woman must do what she wants to do and uh, go where she wants to go, and et cetera, et cetera. Let me say before that, um, that, uh, of course, I had not heard you read before last night. And when you read, you break into song, really, almost. Uh, your, your, your intonation goes up, and you're almost singing mm -hmm. at points in your reading, which I thought was so wonderful, um, so, so beautiful. I um, have an awful singing voice. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't think about it as singing. I think of it as trying to really get my listeners to feel what I felt as mm -hmm. I wrote the poem. Mm -hmm. When I when I read your work, uh, when I first began reading your work, and I had not read this about your work, I felt that I was, I felt very much as though you had uh, were writing in the Walt Whitman tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, when I heard you read last night, I thought, I hear, I hear America singing. Good <laughs> Lord, <laughs> you did. <laughs> I heard one of the things. How cute. <laughs> you know, I really did. And I heard also, um, um, I you don't know. You didn't hear any, any part I of Africa spoon. singing? Oh, yeah. yes. But yeah, maybe we just don't know Africa I hear song well enough to be able to recognize how wonderful. <laughs> you know what? I did hear some cadences that reminded me of Nikki Giovanni in one or two of your poems. There were some cadences there. Is that Africa? Would you say that about Nikki Giovanni again? I really want to get this straight. Repeat okay. I, there was a poem <laughs> last night that you read, and there were cadences in it that reminded me. I have heard her. And, and reminded me of I her, know her. You, yeah. Well, I was, I was sure you probably did. Reminded me of some of, of several of her of her poems. I mean, the cadences were the same, and the the intonations were very very similar. Well, although Nikki was born on the same day I was, June seventh, mm -hmm. quite a few years difference in yeah, our ages. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to say this about uh, well, first about her. She has had a couple of ways of writing, you know. She mm -hmm. hasn't always written as she writes. Now, I don't know just what it was you were recently reading, but uh, was it something from my no, house, was, perhaps? No, it was which something. Which is so different from the true import of present dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. which begins, uh, nigger, can you kill? Can you kill? Mm -hmm. Can you kill a honky? Can you? <laughs> no, it wasn't that. No, it she was earlier. Write that way it anymore. was earlier. It was earlier work. No, it was, it was, there was, I have a record or I have a recording of her reading with some music in the background. Oh, was that her her album of hymns? Of no, it not wasn't hymns. that one. It was another one. one. You have that one, the ones with the Gospel hymns. music, gospel that poems. On not that one. What is that, the name of it? I think that's... The one I have is not that. It's got more jazzy type music. It's wonderful music in the background, and she's she's doing her poems. And there were just a couple, of, uh, and I can't remember which poem you were reading, either last night that that made me think of of, the, of her cadence. And it may have, it may just be, and I don't know. Um, I don't even know why I'm telling you this. It's interesting. <laughs> I just wish you could remember the poem that she wrote that you were. Um, Thinking, uh, well, the one, of course, that that, that the one that I, I remember, but I don't know if this is the one that I was thinking of that I heard her say, was the one. What's the name of it? The one that ends, but Nikki isn't this counter-revolutionary. You know, when she comes in her in her dashiki, and she she starts being really sexy, and her man is not interested. You know. In which the sex or the dashiki? In the sex, he, because he's because he is so entrenched in the revolution. Uh huh. And uh, oh, you remember that? You yes, remember that? I remember that poem, and yeah. I also I know who the man was. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know that. I don't want to reveal anything. <laughs> <sorry about it. laughs> but I don't know that that was the poem. I just I had not I had not heard that in in 
I mean, your your points and hers did not seem to be. I, I no, they really a aren't of, alike of, at of, all. I couldn't find anything. And uh, I was like one of the few people time. when she came on the scene who really got excited about this, as it seemed to me, new note. Mm -hmm. It was new then. Um, and I would have all kinds of arguments with some of the people in Chicago uh, who could not see its great worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But I said, there's something raw and fresh here, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's different. It's unique. Yes, mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know. There was something you read last night that I, I just heard some of those cadences in, and I, you know, it just was a perception that I had. <laughs> but I, because I had but not I seen any similarity. I was fascinated by the, uh, the, the new freedom of those uh, young people in the late 60s. That is, uh, the people I like to call the big four. Nikki with her first pawns. I'm not uh, 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 at the feet of these new things that she's mm -hmm. doing because mm -hmm. they're what a lot of other people are doing. Mm -hmm. But she did have something new and important along with Sonia Sanchez who mm -hmm. was here. Did you all get to see her when she came? No. Oh, you should have seen her. No, no, no. Oh, we well, she is one of the people who helped turn us. black poetry around. Mm -hmm. Etheridge Knight and uh, hockey, Hi, uh, he first of all. And uh, I admire what they did. I do not want to imitate any of them, never did. But uh, I do want to find, as I like to put it, a Gwendolynian way of uh, reaching all manner of blacks. Because there are things I want to say to all blacks, not just those who go to college, but all mm -hmm. blacks. And uh, I can't do it by imitating the sonnets of John Donne. Because <laughs> you can't take those into a tavern. <laughs> I hate to do this, but Harry Shaw is downstairs, and I would like for you to move and let Gwen Glenn sit there, please. And would you mind reading that poem to be in love for us or before you leave? And, and let me ask you one quick question. But why have you chosen that poem? If you want uh, uh, something on tape, choose? why oh, wouldn't you want something that's more representative? That oh, is a poem that you anybody choose. could that's have written. You it choose. But it's, it's still so nice. No, anybody like. couldn't have yeah. written that. No. The, uh -uh. Uh, your, no. Your word power in that poem, anybody uh, couldn't have uh, written that. But you know what I mean, well, don't you? Well, I mean, there's nothing in there that speaks particularly, speaks at all of of you. my life as it has had to be. <laughs> Do you yeah. mind moving? And also, let me ask you a question before you read, and that is, you said you don't send your work out, that you mainly, um, as I understood it, just go to books. Um, I prefer to do that. Yeah. Once so, in a while, yeah. somebody, somebody will request, uh, like the Tribune sometimes has requested a poem uh -huh. for a special. Want me that. there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Well, don't get the set this in the back. I'll work but it you out. Know, what is, yeah, talking about the Tribune, I just remembered about the Poet Laureate thing I wanted to ask you. Are you required to do anything as Poet Laureate of, of Illinois? Um, do you have to no, write occasional I don't poems? I have to do anything. Or Once I was asked to write a poem or, um, and read it at uh, Dan Walker's inauguration as governor, and I wrote a poem just as general as I could make it, <laughs> called Aurora. Didn't have anything to do with the governorship. Uh, it spoke of all of us as having. Uh, oh well, that's but uh, well, this what I have, have done, I have decided uh, that even though I don't have to do anything, I, I ought to uh, take advantage of this opportunity. And so uh, I started uh, ten years ago, eleven years ago now, uh, what I call poet laureate yeah. awards, right. and I have uh, a contest every spring for elementary school kids and high school kids and I give the best uh, poems that come to me awards and the University of Chicago has been very helpful. They uh, host the recital that I have for the winners. They read their poems and uh, their families are invited to a big lunch. And they really enjoy it. They get their money in public. Do they get, where does the money come from? Because out of my <laughs> handbag. Oh, it does. Yeah. And my That's husband keeps saying, you ought to get it uh, uh, funded, you know. And I don't yeah. say whether it's sensible or not. I feel that uh, the kids will appreciate more 
knowing this is a personal gift from me. Oh, yeah. That's something that the government can be made to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> What's the address of the girl, girl, friend? Uh, uh, 7524 Cottage Grove uh, 60619 The papers are very cooperative too and they publish these poems. Well, that's wonderful for the newspapers to do that. Are you talking yeah, about the Chicago papers? papers. Yeah. yeah, this is the best one. Uh, this is your, these are your winners. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look at him, he is really going to town reading, isn't he? Isn't he having a good time? Uh, uh, yeah, now that boy was um, uh, deaf. Oh, oh, he's using uh, sign language. And you, if you read his poem, you'll see that he speaks a bit deaf. Oh. What? Oh. Well, you know, you wrote you, the, the Chicago Picasso was an occasional poem um, you were asked to write. Yeah, but and that I wasn't that poet laureate. You were poet laureate. Yeah. Which poem are you going to read for us? Oh, what? Oh, what? It's too obvious to read for you, real <laughs> However, probably only you can read that the way it ought to be read. <laughs> Would you want me to? <laughs> well, I have that. Okay. You do? Oh, yeah, from mm -hmm. last night. I faced your last night. Oh, you did? Yeah, so well, not uh, something from last night. Okay. Let's see. Although when you said music in love, then that's when I was speaking of the... Or do you have a, a, a poem that's going <laughs> you're in You're not even aware of this, are you? Huh? No, no. <laughs> do I have what? Do you have a poem that is not in the book that you have in your head that's going in the... Oh, well, I'd rather not uh -huh. do that. Uh -huh. Although you did catch a couple that were not uh, published. Well, we're not going to do anything with that except play the workshop. Okay. Okay. You, um, you, shouldn't she sit over here, maybe? No, uh, no, we'll yeah, get her. She has a good voice. <laughs> Kitchenette building. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> That's the last one. <laughs> we are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan. Great if and great. Dream makes a giddy sound. Not strong, like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes its white and violet, fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall, flutter or sing an aria down these rooms, even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warn it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message let it begin we wonder but not well not for a minute since number five is out of the bathroom now we think of lukewarm water hope to get in it that this comes from much kitchenette living my husband and i were young married I know that. I lived in New York City. Oh, I, was you I had two babies in um, in New York. Um, and, How um, old are they now? I have a son who will be 18 in March. Oh. A daughter who will be 16 and a half in uh, September, and a son who's eight. Oh, but the two babies. Your hands are full. <laughs> yeah, and I'm divorced. So. Uh, my husband was in medical too. school. In fact, we left a block from the Audubon Ballroom uh, where Malcolm X we were there when he was shot. You Not were. in the ballroom, but we were in, in that neighborhood. Uh -huh. uh, so it was a traumatic time. We were in New York uh, for four years while he was at Columbia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was, a, it was a, a tremendously interesting experience for me as a Southern girl to be in a 
an apartment in New York City mm -hmm. after having lived with the green grass around all the time, mm -hmm. having two babies, and I would take them out and, you know, to the park. There was a park about five blocks away. You were going to tell your kitchen that story, and we interrupted you, though, how that poem came about. Oh, yes, I was yeah. just going to say that I lived in a number of kitchen and apartments. And uh, there was uh, the one in which my son was suddenly born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of five little kitchenette groupings. And uh, there was a big overflowing garbage can in the front that everybody <coughs> used, and a single bathroom at the back that all the five families had to use. <laughs> 